will now be recorded. <laughs> Loud and clear. Yeah. Is it me or is it you who goes first? <laughs> you you just started, I think. We don't need, oh, me. Uh, okay. Me. Okay. We don't need very formal introduction. We already sent it okay. to you. Okay, so maybe... cool. All right. Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm Alexa. Um, I thought we could just like start by introducing ourselves, um, just each saying our name and I don't know, anything you really want to say, like what art forms you do, where you are, what, why you do what you do, as much as you want to say, just to introduce ourselves before we start. Do you want me to go first? I'll go first. <laughs> I'm Alexa Wilson and I'm based in New Zealand. I've been living in Berlin for the last 10 years and I recently returned. I'm, I'm an artist, an uh, interdisciplinary artist of dance, performance, video and writing. And my work engages with political and philosophical questions and commentaries um, around a certain topic in an activating manner. So that is probably what I would say about my work. But um, maybe AJ, do you want to go next? Me? Yeah. Uh, I introduced myself. Okay. I think the right. speaker is, is fine. First, we need to know a speaker. All right. Should I say? Yeah, 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 yeah. Go, go, go. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Manmeet. I'm based in Delhi, and uh, I'm a trained painter. But uh, after I uh, graduated from art college, I have not painted since. And uh, yeah, I uh, I would say that I'm an interdisciplinary artist myself. I do video, I do photography, I do performances, mm -hmm. and I have been wanting to uh, paint for quite some time now. And my work is. Uh, a lot about my life and women of life, uh, life of women in general. And uh, yeah, I actually really don't know what to say about my work. So yeah, that's just about it. And yes, it's nice to meet everybody. Okay, Dagmar. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Dagmar. Uh, last name is Klausnitzer Smith. Um, I am in Braunschweig, Germany. Here in my studio, which is called Werftraum. Um, I'm an artist and I do work uh, a lot in performance, um, mainly um, giving performance art workshops internationally. Um, a lot in India last year and in previous years in Berlin, uh, collaborating with other artists, which we have co-facilitated a workshop whereby uh, each day another artist has uh, facilitated the group and that was very successful. Um, I'm um, working also in my studio with photography performance for the camera especially now um, a lot of video work is emerging um, because of the isolated situation which i think we will talk about later so i'm very happy to be here and thank you yes now um, oliver joshua like, just go one, like, Oliver. Yeah, I can go next. I'm Oliver, nice to meet you all. Thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, yeah, so I live in Montpellier, France, um, where I'm doing uh, the Excess Master of Choreography, um, which is on hold at the moment until September. Um, uh, and before that, I was living in Germany um, for six years. And before that, I was living in New Zealand, where I was born. Um, I would say stuff about my research, but um, I'm also aware that it's since the 
since Corona arrived on the scene, everything seems to be changing very quickly. So it's uh, still a evolving question about um, yeah how we continue here and everything. So, yeah. yeah, I'm sure we'll get into that. No, just was your turn. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Josh. I'm a choreographer from New Zealand also. I've been living in Berlin now for uh, five or six years. And my work has changed over the years, it changes. Uh, but currently I'm looking into the uh, choreographics of uh, mark making and drawing with chalk with um, two or three people in quite intimate performance settings so yeah it's quite my work at the moment is quite minimalist i would say uh, kind of exhausting to make <laughs> for me but in the past i've worked with um masculine identities and objects and uh, sound and things like that Yeah, I think Alexa, you start the the. I think that the we we uh, are for speakers of today. Okay, cool. All so right. We can go and uh, like start the session. Then lastly, we can you know the interact. It will take time, and for you might be too late. Oh, true. No, it's all right. I don't mind. It's uh, I don't mind going till one a.m. It's fine. <laughs> it's the most exciting thing I've done all week. <laughs> um. So yeah, thanks very much for inviting me to moderate. Um. I'm also I've also been curating Experimental Dance Week in New Zealand for the last couple of years, and we've recently been postponed, and we're we're engaged in lots of reflections with the artists, including interviews. So. One of the things I've found really exciting is actually having these kinds of discussions and conversations with artists and around the world too during such a sort of uncertain and um, yeah precarious time for the art. Um, and there's a whole list of really interesting questions that the Room of Thought have um, created, which I'm sure we'll get to. And I'm really excited and honoured that I've been asked to do to open the first one. I decided when I looked at the questions to, um, I've seen that there's a focus on space and time, which is which is great because that's what we we've got plenty of and we have we don't have plenty of right now, um, in lots of ways. So I was interested in focusing on specifically the body, um, conceptually as um, in the sense of space and time as well, and the impact on body, the body and bodies. Um, in and around the politics that are occurring during this time. Um, and so I thought a question that I would start with is for all of you as um, different um, artists and different art forms, what are, what are your thoughts around the body or bodies in a time of increasing political instability and digital technologies and especially now, accelerating in the time of COVID nineteen, that's quite a broad question, and you can take you can answer it as personally or politically or abstractly as you like. I can repeat it. It's what are your thoughts around the body or bodies in a time of increasing political instability and digital technologies accelerated in COVID nineteen. Yeah, if anyone wants to. I'll say something. Uh, just something specifically about the the COVID situation, which is that the there's like a new dimension of the body. Well, not a new dimension, but um, something that's always been there that now everybody is hyper conscious of, which of course is the contagious aspect, right? So, in fact, the um, there's something in terms. There's a new. Uh, focus on distance, physical distance between physical bodies, at least in where I am. Um, and so there's this like re-articulate, there's this, uh, the new normal of bodies in space, 
is to be at least two meters apart at all times and to have the orifices covered which just at a very very simple basic level is something i've never experienced in my life before that's like a new kind of body it's like the contagious body everybody now has the contagious body <laughs> we all have to act as if we have it i mean we always do anyway we're always contagious of something but yeah. um, and it's this this whole situation is of course mixed up with the political instability and with digital technology uh, in terms of like tracing apps and stuff like the the discussion in germany around tracing applicate contact tracing applications has been very heated um and there's been a lot of concern into designing privacy protection into the app that that does get used um and then people not really trusting that kind of process so all of those, I feel like all of those kind of privacy issues around technology are being uh, completely heightened by this situation. I feel many issues have heightened and um, received a very specifically specific focus. Um, since this time uh, of March up to now. Um, but I feel also that often now I am also more aware of my own body moving in time. I feel that uh, through this isolation, the, the concentration on the intimate body has heightened. Uh, in my own way of being in my studio. I am here in the studio. I'm here in the making process. I I am more isolated as it is a, um, how to say, um, a given. It's not my choice. It is a given. So it's like a forced situation, yes. Um, but I forget that it's forced. In in the studio and moving, making, moving with the objects, making the objects involving my body um, has given me a very strong sense of concentration. Like the yeah. sort of you go. No, you go. I was just going to say, uh, related to that, in terms of time, I feel like in quarantine, it's like it's. I feel like we're, I'm out of time. Like reg normal time has been suspended, and I'm in. I'm in a bubble of something else entirely. Like I almost don't feel time passing, even though like there's there's almost nothing to break it up. It's just this long stretch of something else which does allow you to be very concentrated um, in a way. Yeah, I remember, something remember a curious, right at the beginning, speaking of like changing bubbles, like in terms of you know, speaking of time there, but I, but I also notice how space changes as well. Uh, I live in a university residence here. And so some of my colleagues also live in the same building. And we would be, we have weekly meetings on uh, Zoom. Um, and it, maybe on the same day, I would be calling my mother, who's in New Zealand. Uh, and it, it was this curious kind of like crash of um, the person who lives just down the hall from me, maybe 10, 10 steps, was on my screen, as well as my mother, who's on the other side of the world, was on the screen. Uh, later that day, and suddenly being both of those people being pushed into the um, same virtual space, and there was kind of some kind of equalizing of um, of these people in my life. Normally, I would, um, you know, I'd prioritize the person who's cl closest to me physically, um, but now in this new situation, all of my relationships around the world. Uh, we're in the same the same distance, the same virtual distance, um, and so that really changed 
yeah, how I how I'm relating to people around the world. Found that super interesting. Uh, for me, it has been. Um, it was all of a sudden that the lockdown happened. You know, uh, I'm also teaching in a school, and, and I'm a single parent, so life is uh, was very busy for me. Um, a lot of things on the personal front. So uh, for me, um, initially it was like a slowing down of everything. I don't have to step out of the house after coming back from school. I don't have to struggle for time with my daughter. And uh, and actually as an artist, uh, you always want that, okay, you have a running in income coming and you can sit in your studio and work. And uh, so when the lockdown happened, it felt like the perfect situation, you know, that uh, you can now ease down on things. And uh, But yes, there was total lack of concentration. And uh, uh, I think uh, with, so it's been uh, 40 days now, more than that. And now I am coming to terms with this whole thing uh, because it, it took, for me, it took a lot of time to process. Uh, you know, there was also a lot of panic that uh, the shops will be shut. And the day the first lockdown was announced and I went to the grocery shop and people were buying 10 liters of milk. So it, it is like, you know, so many things are entering. There's panic, there's fear. It's just me and my daughter at home and what if something happens? And uh, gradually I came out of this whole understanding. There was some calming down. Um, and uh, I have started observing my body more, uh, how, how it, uh, it responds when it needs time to rest, when I'm pushing myself. So uh, it has been um, very healing for me. Uh, it's all this is like at a very personal uh, level, you know, it, it has been healing in, in many ways. And uh, there has been uh, uh, forging new connections. Uh, and also I think uh, like so many things have become too virtual and like virtual is becoming more real. Uh, like video calls is if you if I want to talk to somebody, I am not doing any um, phone calls. I am doing video calls straight away. So it it is also affecting relations. There's a lot of filtration happening for me. Uh, I'm seeing several sides of people. So yeah, it, this is yeah that has been my understanding of this COVID. The scare has finally gone away. Uh, I'm mentally now prepared that it might happen to me. And the only thing is to be able to survive it. And we are trying to stay on the positive of things. Um, yeah. I the, there's sort of this extraordinary um, sensitization that's happening and I'm interested in the twofold aspect of our relationship to bodies, which is our own body and sort of deepening into our own relationship to a body as we're removed of um, external stimulus so much, but then also the kind of understanding of the collective body and um, that the reason why we're in isolation is for the collective body, but also um, the implications, I don't know, on like sort of the mirroring of pain potentially um, across the globe in both those senses as well. And, um, but also political questions around, um, I don't know, the, any kind of elongated um, restrictions on our bodies and what that means politically. There's a lot of questions all in one statement, but. Anyone has any? Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yes. uh, yeah for me, uh, it's been a very, uh, how to say, uh, my body and I have to also take care of my mother's body. So it's become like a wall. Uh, and I'm not allowing anyone to enter in my space and I protect my mother's body, you know, so it's like building one more wall 
in, in mm -hmm. your own layer. So I'm building several layers. So it's like multiplying myself in a way and uh, protecting the my you know, aged mother. So uh, it's been always a kind of fear in my mind, like, you know, because she is quite uh, immune to uh, uh, health conditions. So I have to be extra cautious and I'm the only one who goes out for essentials and things like that. So I take extra, extra uh, careful I do extra, extra careful things. And then I feel that I'm I'm the responsible and I have to build an extra layer and I have to protect my body more stronger. I have to make more stronger so that I can uh, kind of uh, protect her also. So, so it's like um, you have to build up your personality more stronger in a way, like not physically, I feel, you know, you have to build your body, uh, uh, you have to feel your body to be kind of positive. Uh, and yeah, that's what I feel. Yeah. I just want to say that for me, uh, what I have uh, understood is that the body is not separate from the mind and the mind is more powerful than the body, you know, uh, to motivate yourself uh, to start the day, to motivate yourself to cook, you know, every day and uh, to pick up the washed clothes and, uh, and, and to give up on certain struggles. Uh, it, it is difficult. I mean, the body will, uh, the body just wants to rest. It is my mind which is being more powerful. Um, yeah, I just, that is what I wanted to, you know, say that I just cannot separate the body from the mind. Yeah. Um, I feel also um, what has been said um, in terms of how we individually in our world are reacting. And as artists, we have had in the past many times concerns and searches for the understanding of time and space. But now, since there is a forced and restricted situation, a new situation occurring, um, there is no longer the mere contemplation about time and space or re-evaluation of time and space, but it is actual. So as more as we are moving communicative into the virtual, which I don't know what that is, um, but it's in the absence for the moment of the public. Um, we are resuming um, into an almost untheoretical way of experiencing time and space and our body within it. Um, yeah, that's Sorry. I'm not meaning an assumption of the world or all of us. Um, it is, I'm speaking for me. Sorry. No, no, but it's quite interesting, uh, Dagma. Like you quote the very uh, like untheoretical way to, <laughs> and that quotation I think is quite good. So we also, we don't know, it's a very, in, Hypothetical, it's still we need to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, it's it's super embodied. I think it's a really interesting point. And um what's interesting, like what um Manmeet has also mentioned about the, the the no dissolve between mind and body, what what the impact on our body is of the psychological effects of what's happening is one thing. But then also the the virtual world and the virtual bodies that we're experiencing because that is easier to theorize in a way because it is outside us um, and we're watching and observing it um, but that split is kind of occurring and i find that interesting like what a as we are in these kind of embodied states that are very real and what are untheoretical um we are being kind of bombarded by the rhetoric of the virtual um and we, we actually we're so new in the virtual world but we are literally bodies exist in the virtual world 
and how that affects our psychology as well. Yeah, I just want to add that. Uh, so yesterday I was uh, watching Dharma's uh, interview with Anupam. Uh, I really enjoyed. It was really amazing, Dharma. And I saw that uh, she had dressed up. She was wearing this beautiful eye makeup. And uh, and uh, today, <laughs> for being here, I was like, okay, uh, this is something different than what I am doing because uh, like staying at home under lockdown, the it's a lot of casualness has come in uh, in many ways like if i would go to my workplace then i am dressing up and uh, so today i just made an effort to uh, probably step out from that space of mental lockdown and because i'm going out sitting here in my bedroom chair and meeting other people so yeah i just <laughs> wanted to say that Yeah, I find I've been I've been um the the big roller coaster. I mean, I've been in lockdown for or we have in France been in strict lockdown for eight weeks, um, and it's of course been a big roller coaster of a whole bunch of sensations and feelings and emotions and panics and and everything else that I think with most of us have probably all been through to some extent. Um, but the amount um, of work that it takes to stay afloat, to stay um, healthy, that, that I found that I had to be very, very conscious of um, of making sure that I do, like that I go for a walk every day, stupid, simple things like that. Um, that I make sure that I don't miss that. Um, that I that I make sure that I uh, have a conversation in the hallway with someone at a distance. But um, and it was interesting for me to see how much work that that took because Manmet, you said um, you know that the body wants to rest a lot uh, or the body wants to be comfortable or something. I guess I can that resonates with me a little bit. It just seems to take a lot of conscious effort to stay to stay good, to stay, you know, to take care of your psychology in this extreme um, situation that we're all in. Um, and those were new new kind of skills. I guess I would take it for granted, um, the ability to hug people, you know, because I live alone here. Um, so at least for the first four weeks, I was really um, just by myself, which, you know, that's I've never experienced that in my life. I've always lived with people. And as a dancer, I'm always uh, in physical contact with people as well. Um, so it took a, it's been a big learning um, learning experience, I guess, of how to how to manage um, these things. I uh, just a thought in terms of. Um, maintaining psychological well-being. Uh, uh, I, f I find the domestic rhythms for us important. Um, and I have my young daughter to distract me most of the time who needs a lot of attention, so that's nice. And also tiring. But uh, we live in some uh, important historical buildings from the communist era in, in Berlin. And uh, the, the buildings we live in are quite large and create a district that's quite um, imposing and, and uh, we have large pillars uh, and archways and walkways around our building. And people, uh, since we've lived here for a few years, people often use it for shooting music videos or fashion shoots. It happens most weeks, there'll be at least something happening around here. And at the moment, it's happening a lot, usually in groups of two people. And everything that's being made, uh, the artistic products that are being made, are all completely apocalyptic. <laughs> so, like, one day I'm playing at the back of our building with my daughter, and there's a woman in a full latex jump jumpsuit with a like a latex jump mask, uh, face mask, like with huge spiky platform heels, striking all these poses against these like 
huge pillars that look super desolate and like out of some film. And then last night we got woken up by um, someone out the front of the house on the big highway um, filming a hip hop music video. And it was the, the it's, this, it's this huge avenue and it's completely deserted at two in the morning because no one's around because of quarantine and everything. And you have this really spooky hip hop music playing and they're flooding the performer with blue light and all of the lyrics are about the end of the world and stuff. So like you wake up to this kind of, I, I woke up to this kind of really disturbing vision and then had to try and go back to sleep. And it, it actually kind of, it actually kind of upset me a bit because it, um, uh, I totally understand what they're doing and that they want to do, but like it made me notice how fragile my sense of well-being is in a way that something that I would usually find quite interesting had actually disturbed me because I've been working quite hard to not freak out, I guess. And like, like you were saying, um, I, mean, uh, I feel like it's normalized to an extent now. Like I don't feel that freaked out like I did at the beginning, but then there's these things that happen now and then that still, still throw me a bit. And I just thought it was interesting also in terms of people still making their art in public space and working even under quarantine even if it is just to produce apocalyptic images. But I guess it's their only chance, right? Because once it's over, there'll be people everywhere again. Berlin's had the apocalyptic fetishization for a while, hasn't it? This kind of imagery as a city. Yeah. I just want to add uh, when Joshua said that people are making art, it, it is very pressurizing uh, to see other people, you know, do art, create art, and uh, when Ajay, he uh, wanted me to be a part of the previous uh, event he hosted, and uh, the title was Room for Thought, and uh, he said, if you want to make a video or something, and uh, and I, it was very difficult for me, because uh, for me, I realized there is no room for thought. I mean, my thinking process has totally stopped. And uh, it's like I just I I I'm also like amazed at how people are wanting to uh, sharing things on Facebook. It is like you know. So I have stopped going on Facebook. I if I feel like something really I want to share, then I go online and share something. And I think there is a lot of pressure to uh, keep on doing art. I mean, you don't need to do art all the time. Uh, it, it is what is this need to you know share each and everything of uh, yours i mean it it is very pressurizing and uh, yeah i am i'm keeping my i am protecting myself for uh, for my daughter and me uh, and my own sanity too so that i can keep on go, going and uh, enjoy the the everyday you know this is the opportunity when um, I am enjoying everything. And uh, another thing I wanted to ask, like for us in India, it is a drastic life change in terms of the lifestyle because uh, there is no help at home. We are, uh, we cannot survive without any help at home. Uh, and uh, uh, me being a single parent, I needed more. So I was very dependent uh, on this help. I had a 12 hour help. And uh, initially, it, it was a lot of struggle to do everything. You want to keep the house clean, you have to cook, you have to clean the utensils. There is no dishwasher. Uh, God bless you, Rita. She made coffee for me, my daughter. Vrishti is <laughs> We want to see you. Vrishti, come here. So, yeah, it has been like a, a drastic. Uh, Come, everybody wants to say hi to you. This is Brishti. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I was just telling everybody you made your coffee. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so, yeah, it has all of this trying to organize the house and everything. If you want to sit and create art, I mean, I am in admiration of. Uh, people living in the West who are uh, doing everything on their own and also doing art. 
it, it's it's very difficult. So yeah, I just wanted to add these two things. Well, I, I'm not Sorry. doing anything. Sorry, I have my yeah. daughter. I have my daughter, and I, I'm not. I don't have time to do anything. I'm just cooking, cleaning, and looking after her, and then going to sleep. Sorry, Pavis. Oh no, I was just going to say yeah. I, I don't know too many people making art actually. Um, I mean, I know there's lots of we can you know we can go to a conversation about the virtual stuff, but there's a lot of virtual programming occurring. Um, but yeah, so I guess I guess that's making up. I don't know what I don't know what people are up to, but um, there's definitely a sense of suspense of like suspension of art practice in general. Um, and I my sense is like there's a kind of a trauma, like a trauma that being experienced um, globally um, which is causing you know that sort of slowing down and, and desire not you know to, to, to back away from and being really sensitive to um, yeah things outside us and that um, part of what we're going through and the impacts of that on our bodies and our minds together um, seems really real to me um, yeah, like the vulnerability. And I don't know if it's being talked about so much um, necessarily as being that. Um, it seems like people are trying to keep things light a lot and on social media and stuff, that's what I observe, um, rather than, um, or, or, or the other side, like really heavy and conspiracy theories and things like that. But um, it's like the response to vulnerability, really. Um, it's really real. Mm -hmm. um, very, very interesting thoughts. And I was thinking uh, while listening to all these various perspectives of uh, the body and how, how we are dealing with it. And um, I have uh, had, had a very interesting experience. First, because I was earlier reading something for something else before Corona came in. I was doing some research work and came across some articles on, on uh, the whole idea of labor and body and so which uh, when corona started and then the lockdown began, began one of the ideas which i started actually kind of observing or thinking about and discussing with my partner was that my first thought was that if a lockdown will happen the company because oh and also it was triggered by one of the first cries when when people realized that it corona has hit italy big time and now it is going to hit the rest of the west so for china it was not such a big issue but the west immediately became important and the issue was oh the economy will crash not how many people will die but the economy will crash and if you start looking at the news news at that time that was the focus and I was already reading something actually on economy and labor and capitalism. And then my thought was, okay, if they're going to do a lockdown, then they will have to, they, by they I mean the people who own the businesses or the corporates or the capitalists or whoever owns the capital, will have to ensure that people who are at home should not have time to rest. And that was my thought. And I told this to my partner because she works for a museum. And uh, she, of course, had to start working from home. And what happened over the next two or three weeks itself, she was like going crazy. We have two children with that and the work. And she then finally, and I said, why are you not delegating? You have a team under you. And she says, look, I delegated whatever. But what has happened is that I feel I'm working much more right now than I ever did when I was in the office. So this was one thing at, which was happening in my own house. The second was a niece, one of my niece who's very close to me. She's working for a corporate and she's a chartered accountant. So she's the number counting person, which is where the brunt of economy would be. And she almost had a burnout last week. I was following her and I was telling her that, look, you need to understand you're working from home. She was locked in the house and she started telling me that she had to wake up at six in the morning so that she could start working and then manage her team and she has to do various zoom calls and she had to do four to five hours of calls every day during the work time and then on top of that she would have to take phone calls from the manager this that whatever and the number crunching and all 
And by the end, her day was like she would wake up in the morning, and she lives in the, in, the, in the, near Amsterdam. So she's she's an Indian. She's there. She has to cook her own food. She's an Indian, so she needs her Indian food also, which means she must cook rice, dal, whatever. And she's living with a boyfriend, so both of them are Indians, and both of them have to do figure out their food, do all this work, and both are in the same profession, same company. So they were jacked till late in the night, both of them. And finally, I told her, I said, look, and she had a promotion due. So she was like trying to do whatever. And I was telling her that, look, they are going to push you till your death. And nobody is going to regret your death. So you have to step back, take a holiday, tell them you can't work, take your lunch hour. So she was not even able to find the lunch time. So the system was so overlapping that there was no possibility of taking a lunch without doing a call or something. And she was available literally all the time. And finally, she took uh, yesterday. She told me that last week she took a leave and she just said go to hell and she sat home and then she recovered over the weekend. So she was in such a state. So this was the second story, and I was trying to postulate these things on the idea of how the body itself is the repository of labor, and in the present economic system, which is a self a, it is a self-regulating economic system as uh, there was an economist Karl Pol 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 Polanyi or Poliani or Polanyi, something like that is the last name, uh, who, who wrote the book, The Great Transformation uh, about the, the Industrial Revolution. And he wrote it in the uh, 1930s and 40s. And he came up with this idea that the whole idea of labor into a into a commodity is a fiction because labor cannot be a commodity and that labor lies in the body because that's what we do that's what we are selling so no matter whether we are independent artists who have to earn them because everybody has to earn the money so everybody has to sell the labor some either you employ it and selling it for eight hours which has in india now become 12 hours already and uh, in uh, the places we have to work to produce and create so that we can sell that. And that is where our labor goes. And this is my whole um, uh, question and idea I have been grappling with that what COVID would do to the body in that sense. That the, the, the capitalists realize this is where the labor lies. And if people are locked down, how, what can be the system where you can push them so much that they still will not have time. While you may be in the four walls of your house and in one way one can say, oh, I'm sitting at home. But is that being allowed? Is that, uh, is that time really yours? And if so, how? And I think that is where the whole brunt on a lot of people, and these are just two examples I told you. There were quite a few others I have been in touch with who have been literally cracking down under mm -hmm. the system. So, yeah, my two bits. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a great point um, about the labour, the shift. There's been a few things written about the shifting of labour to the house, to home. Um, but that's a really great point about because how can you keep track of the exploitation or the hours that someone's doing from home? I definitely hear that from institutions as well, that they're being completely overworked. and yeah, we see this like imbalance with this extreme happening where um, essential workers or those d deemed essential or um, you know, institutions are getting completely overworked to support the rest of society that is kind of in rest mode. Um, and that extreme causing, you know, immense pressure on everybody, but especially on them. You know, it's been funny to observe how you know this thing of like working from home has becomes this kind of ideal uh, that a lot of office workers and I'm not an office worker so I don't I don't know so much I'm just taking secondhand knowledge but um, but to me it sounds as someone who's never worked in an office it sounds horrible to work to do to take my work home um, even as a choreographer uh, and a Dancer. I mean, I basically haven't danced or had a choreographic thought for the past eight weeks. I have because I've been at home. You know, I've, I've really framed my over the years. I've framed my um, my choreographic practice and my dancing as as work, as labour, and as a job. Um, 
And so it's interesting to see my colleagues as well, other people who were able to dance at home, who were able to work on their art at home um, in this way. I really wasn't able to do that. And the idea of like bringing your work into into your home, just for me, I'm, that seems like uh, more dystopia than utopia. But um, but I never worked in an office, so um, I guess I don't quite know. <laughs> And also, what, what you you talked about um, this lightness, um, Alexa. You know that there's been this push to you know keep it light, keep it, and and I've seen that as well. And and it's, to a certain point, um, I respect that as well. You know, people's people's coping strategies, and it's been interesting to observe that how everyone copes differently. Some people's coping strategies have been to work a lot. You know, that's been their only thing that they've been able to do. Others is to watch stupid movies. Others is to meditate. Uh, all these, all these different um, coping strategies. And I guess I can, I can respect anyone's strategy. But it's been interesting to see how I've had to juggle that in terms of understanding my my job as an artist, not necessarily as a choreographer and as a dancer. Which, as I said, you know, I haven't really been able to get into any practices while I've been stuck at home. But um, but my my identity and my my job as an artist is okay. So maybe it's not focused on production at the moment for these for this quarantine time. But uh, but what I do maintain is a certain attention to the world um, and to what's going on and to resting in in the depths of of what's going on. Um, yeah, and really being attentive. To that, so I understand that as my job and my work as an artist and my service to to my community and my societies is is to be in the depths of things. Um, and I think that's something that I've that I've learned over these last few weeks is that's really the one of the one of the jobs of artists. That's why we we're allowed to be artists in our societies because we need, do need people to be in those depths. Um, and so I've, I guess I've taken that quite seriously. Um, and that's been hard and difficult. And I've had to, you know, I've had to, find, as I was saying earlier, I've, I've had to find my strategies of, of, you know, of looking after my psychological health and everything. Um, but yeah, and then there's other times where where I have to give up that work and I really just have to escape and I have to watch some stupid Hollywood movie. Um, and that's really important for my psychological health at times. But it's been interesting to see that I, you know, to take this job seriously of being in the depths, and that's my job as an artist, not necessarily to produce anything at this stage, but to, but to be resting in the depths somehow. Um, I think it's um, the difference between the physicality of labor and the mental labor, and. It seems that this extreme unusual situation has increased the mental labor and that in terms of the cognitive capitalism has increased the amount of control and then the amount of control being flattened solely by the image yeah, the image that we are sharing, not the bodies or the physicality that we are sharing or the energy that may transfer or be transmitted between bodies, but in the absence of that. And um, I I'm, I'm, uh, want to say also to uh, Manmit, when you were saying that the motivation for the making process, for the physicality, of making or artistic making process um, is fragile, is as at a crucial situation. Um, but I don't feel at all the need for sharing, the need for sharing via the social media, um, although one does that. But it's the, the making process in this uh, heightened situation now that is more to do with me, more in the reflection of the values that seem to not be as 
visible before. What are those those values? Hello. Yeah, did that, are you asking me or everyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'm just interested to hear more. I mean, the values are not clear, or they are being re-evaluated now. They are being in another process because of that mental occupation, because of that. Uh, mental labor that Harvest was yeah. talking about the, the the necessity for labor or the position of the laborer, but what kind of it? That's what I'm asking, and that seems to be now at a crucial point. It's not okay. because of the image, the flattened image. You know what I'm. Uh. Yeah, it's interesting that flattened image, and this is um, um, what happened in 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 this situation of virtual uh, situation where you're talk, referring to very nicely as flattened image. Uh, last year, what we uh, two years ago now, 2018, when we organized an event called Biennale, where Manmeet was also part of it. One part of that Biennale was, and it was about performance uh, arts. In one part, what we did was that there were four Swiss artists here in Switzerland, and the Indian four artists, of which Manmeet was one, were in India. And we created an internet uh, kind of a situation where the four Indian artists performed in India and the four Swiss artists performed in Switzerland. And the performances were one after the so one Swiss, so one Indian, one Swiss, so one it, it was knitted like that. All of it was one curated program. There were two separate links. So when a performance was happening in India, the Swiss artist can watch it. The Swiss audience can watch it here. When it was happening here, the Indian audience can watch it there. And both those links we made open. So somebody sitting in the drawing room was able to watch both of them, choosing whichever link they want to open up and watch whatever may be happening. And the whole experiment was about, about seeing how the virtual, exp uh, the, uh, the virtual space, what does it do, what does it offer? And uh, our idea was to explore this uh, big notion which was about internet that oh internet has opened up the world and everybody now you know it's easy to communicate across the world and it has liberated and given freedom and da 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 and this is exactly what one of our ideas was that it may give us the freedom that we can sit here in different parts and talk to each other but as we realize that each one of us is focused on this little screen in front of us we have to stay focused more or less on the screen we can look here and there a bit but ultimately it is the screen and this was our postulate our, our theme was that while we liberate in the sense that you may perform here and can be seen in new zealand or in india wherever but you will be captured by the frame of that camera and this frame in which we are talking which you're talking referring to as the flattened image and this is exactly what we are seeing in terms of how the the owner of the capital or the accumulated labor who has employed people, what are they doing? So on one hand is the freedom or you can work from anywhere. So suppose tomorrow the corona goes and the next thing might be that oh, you can work from anywhere. You can go to Hawaii and work and sit on an island or on a beach or whatever. But you will be captured within these four walls of your camera and screen. And this is the new kind of a cage, which people may realize or not, but this was the experiment we were doing, the, the, which we tried then. And this is the second thought which I have. So the, and the image, and it, if you notice that after uh, a, a while, this idea to continuously focus on the screen is not so easy. It, it tires you out. And there are already researches which tell us that looking at the screen, because this requires focus when I'm, when even I, where, where, whether I listen or I just hear, sorry, whether I speak or I hear, I must focus on this, my auditory senses and my 
uh, eyes most of the time and this tires the brain much more than when we are sitting in an open situation and even if nine of us or ten of us were sitting and chatting in real world it would not have been so tiring as this would be and this is the other trap of this virtual reality so, Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, maybe that's why everybody's so tired all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There are, there are, sorry. Yeah. There are already researchers and they have already produced this. Uh, there is a document, if anybody wants, I can send it across a link where they've said how this is tiring the brain out. And that's why when I mentioned, I thought people would know when I said that my niece was doing four to five hours of uh, video calls and no wonder she was flipping out completely because four to five hours of screen time is like crazy every day. You know, that's what I meant. So, yeah. I just want to add that even though it is tiring to be uh, on the screen or looking at the screen, at the same time, it is addictive. It 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 has it is like this perpetual window which is always open any time of the day or night uh, if you are not scrolling through facebook if you are not reading the books you have downloaded you're watching something uh, either a movie or a series and uh, it, it it somehow you feel it gives you a false hope of filling something inside you and uh, even if you want to move away from it i see myself coming back to you know there's there's some expectation of something happening and uh, so this tiredness uh, i also feel it inside the house because it is you're going from one room to the other the same rooms the same everything is the same and you are just you know walking about uh, in all of them i mean you want to do something different but your options are this laptop or the screen which is like a perpetual window you know, which is open all the time. Yeah, that's just what I wanted to add to what Parvi said. I was thinking today about how social distancing is actually quite exhausting and how when we, as we're starting to move, uh, we will probably begin to move out of lockdown this week um, in New Zealand, um, we will still have to observe social distancing rules and that that will actually be quite exhausting. Um, even mentally, so this mental and physical and emotional exhaustion of having to constantly monitor how far away you are from people and be observant of these kinds of things um, is really quite, will be quite draining in its own right. Um, and I was interested to um, sort of introduce like maybe into the conversation about like what, a, like like what what it is about or what can we do in the context of the inability to gather is particularly given that a lot of us are engaged in performance or what do what are our thoughts around um gathering or the intimacy of gathering when we're not allowed to gather um yeah aj and i were talking about this indian concept of satsang this um sort of um need or yeah the togetherness has been quite an important element of being human and that it, it gives us like it's yeah draining to not be able to gather i guess that's my segue into that that the social distancing is quite draining if anyone had any thoughts about that i just i want to say that i'm actually very happy with the social distancing because uh, nobody can touch me uh, i am free to walk i can <laughs> i mean i have the confidence of dressing up the way i want to and walk out so in that sense uh, yeah it it is <laughs> it's really nice uh, yesterday i'd gone out to buy some groceries uh, in another market and so uh, what is happening is like everywhere else there are these circles marked and you have to stand in your uh, circle and uh, and you have to cover your face right uh, so there was this very young uh, beautiful girl who was wearing a nice short dress and and i was so happy to see her and uh, the thing is that 
because even your mouth is covered. So even if you have any uh, awkward expression, happy, and I was so glad to see that. So I. I Uh, just this last week, um, uh, I've been involved in, I was involved in a project, a series of workshops around um, artistic practice in a city, in an urban context. And it was an open, it was a workshop among artistic peers, but it was open to the public for people to enroll and participate if they wanted. Uh, and it was quite, it was quite confusing to do something for the week. It was, it felt, I mean, it was a total relief, obviously, because I've been shut inside with my family for two months. Um, but it felt both fantastic and really wrong. Uh, and there was a lot of confusion between people about keeping masks on, or keeping them off. We worked outside mostly, so that felt kind of safer in many ways. And we kept distance from each other all the time and only worked a few hours a day. But we spoke a lot and we did hand objects to each other quite a bit as well. And it was, um, it was just weird. <laughs> it was familiar and weird. It was it, uncanny would be another way of putting it. And whenever we, if there were like, sometimes there would be 10 or 15 of us standing around in a, in a very kind of distributed group. People found it super weird as well. People walking past, like, you know, everyone notices a group of people standing together now, of course. Um, yeah, and I just couldn't decide how I felt about the whole thing. Yeah, I think, I think uh, fantastic and wrong at the same time is probably what I'm heading into next week uh, as France releases its lockdown. Um, knowing the, or the expectation being that we'll be in lockdown again, uh, maybe July, August or, or October, November, maybe the, these are the two predictions. Um, yeah, so after, for, for me, like I am just desperate to be together and to, and to be with other people, um, physically in the same space, um, like, and that can happen from tomorrow in groups of 10 and I cannot wait um, but at the same time uh, knowing that uh, that that action is going to put us in lockdown again very soon um, or reasonably soon as the prediction let's fingers crossed not but um, but that's the prediction anyway um, so at the same time it feels wrong but I feel like I kind of have to suspend suspend that part of part of my thinking um, for a bit and just try and enjoy the next the next weeks um, yeah fantastic and wrong hmm. so Dagmar uh, so how you see this like flatten image uh, like you know this which is like very digitally coded and still like there is a physicality of body when you know the the camera is like capturing the body so there is a physical appearance of the body you know so there is a uh, you know the the how one physical aspect of body is transferring transforming in into the digital and so how you look at this because you also work with the photo performances and video and performance performance so you know so you deal with also the where the the image is flat you know the photo photography performance is flat 
So how you look at those performance and how you look at this, the process? I mean, the main difference now, and this is what I said before, is that the limitations are no longer conceptual, freely chosen by myself as the artist because I want to address a certain issue. No, it is a given. It is a, a, a law, if you like, or um, a restriction that is no longer in my own self-control. And that changes my sense perception of the image. I'm looking at it differently. I mean, the, the processes that I have uh, been involved before with performance for the camera or creating a video or uh, creating photography has been my own choice. But now it is due to a situation which is not anymore in my control. So it is an imposition of my own artistic freedom. And I have to understand what that means and what kind of impact it has. But so far um, in previous experiences in these past weeks, um, often I felt no difference because I overlooked consciously the restriction that was given from outside. I purposely cancelled it out. I don't know how possible it is, but um, you know, like we said before, with the the consciousness or with the awareness level for your own process, um, you can navigate through many different situations. Um, so it is it is hovering. Yeah, it's hovering between understanding and knowing the limitations that are given and setting limitations myself. And it's not clear. Uh, I have just been wondering, there's another question because we're talking of both time and space and the body. Yes. Um, I understand the body, it is here, I understand time, we are spending time together. But in terms of space, and especially the idea of virtual space, while this has already been established through the internet, but my question has always been, is there really a thing called virtual space? Or is it just time that where, which we use and imagine that there is a space and we use, because that word itself is quite confusing. We just imagine, and this flattened image and what you're talking, so I'm relating to that. And again, I came over and got this question back today after a long time. But I always wonder, what is this? There is no virtual space, it is just time. And we imagine in that time that we have a space. And the flattened image, of course, helps us. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> No, no, it's okay. It's great that you are um, addressing that because I was thinking this morning, um, how pathetic, you know, we are talking about a virtual or virtuality, getting close to a reality which we haven't even understood. Yeah, I don't know what reality is. I'm trying to define it maybe every day or in the course of time or with some abstract thinking but then to jump immediately to a virtual reality which means that it's close to a re reality which still i don't know yeah it is <laughs> it's very much resemble with the maya <laughs> the illusion illusion of the being there like still like this is actually the illusion we are going through like because if we see we are in a different time zone like if uh, really we see the we are in a very different time zone and we are in a very different uh, set of rooms so even if visually it appearing the every uh, space is very uh, different it appear very different so it might be it is a collage of different time and space we can see somehow but it's not yes yes <laughs> yes the virtual space 
seems very much like an ideological space. It's it's you know it's conceptual. Yeah. Um, so it's full of ideas and concepts and impressions, and um, they're all quite abstract. And we yeah we're so good. We've got such great imaginations that we fill in the gaps. <laughs> but it doesn't really beat live, does it? it doesn't really beat the real space. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, what you said, so my, my question mm -hmm. to that would be, is virtual space filled with questions and ideas or we fill it up with that? Because the virtual space, so this is the question, Where? what is this virtual space? It is actually nothing except when we put in the time, we fill it up with the ideas, we fill it up with the thoughts or images or whatever, otherwise there is no space. And in that sense, it just remains time which is flowing by and the sound is going or the image is whatever it goes is just time there is no virtual space sorry i mean i'm just arguing to to provoke you more yeah please but go ahead you could you could say that there is no space then like because space itself is what we fill it with as well um like whatever space we fill it with is, becomes a culture that we project into so it's just it's the same as in real time. Yeah, the concept of space is it doesn't exist either. It's there is no no there is no like empty space. It doesn't exist. It's just a concept because it always gets filled with something. Yeah, I feel even I feel there is no dimension, you know. The dimension which we used to feel as a space, like a three-dimensional. Now oh, it's flattened. So the dimension of space is gone. It's it's totally flattened. The I I feel the time 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 dimension is evolved. So I can say I'm in 1920s, and you can say in, that I am in 2020s, and you know it's like dimension of time. We are you know we can go back and we can go to future with this uh, kind of an imaginative way. Sorry, Alex, I didn't understand when you were saying that there is actually no space and even space is a concept you're saying. But we are aware that space is not a concept, it's a physical entity. Time is a concept, but space is a physical entity. We can feel it, we can measure it, we can walk around it, we feel it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, I was, yeah. Just that, I, I was just meaning there's no empty space. There is no, there is not, there is no, actually no empty space. There's always something there. You mean in the, because? But always when you say, uh, when you say space is a physical entity and you say virtual space, so virtual uh, in itself uh, is not real in that sense. So it's like, I think it, virtual, I mean, I don't know. I just had this thought that space is a physical entity, but what about virtu virtuality? <laughs> that, that's why I'm saying in, in virtual, the space, virtual space makes no sense. Virtual time, yes. But this, this, is, is, this is what we are creating. Uh, no, this, this meeting which is happening online, this is the virtual space we are creating. Uh, I mean, yeah, that is the only sentence which has come. I mean, I don't know how to explain it further, but this this coming all of us together, uh, we are existing in this virtual space at the same time, you know, being in different continents, all of us. Uh, this is the virtual space. We are. Yeah. yeah, I just want to. Sorry. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to counter your point by saying that even if it's there is no space, why do we have hard disks? Why is there space on a hard disks for virtual space? Why is it called a virtual drive? Who is I think virtual <laughs> could be said as something which cannot be touched. That does not mean it does not exist. Yeah, but it is <laughs> occupying space. It, it, it is acquiring yeah, space. Yeah, of course it is. It of is acquiring it is. space. It, yes, it is it taking is up acquiring. our time. Yeah. Uh, and it is affecting us, so it has to be real. There yeah, is no distinction between the virtual and real on reality per se. 
I mean, virtual is as much real as any other reality is. So I don't know why the negligence of the virtual is prominent in this discussion. I would like to be enlightened on that. Yeah. Uh, see, firstly, virtual um, uh, space on a on a the space on a hard disk is very different from the concept of virtual space that emerges from that hard disk. So the yes. space on the hard disk is not the virtual space. That is space. That is a physical entity. What emerges out of that where we are right now, this is where the issue of virtual space and time. And I am just questioning. I have no problem with either. I am just thinking and saying that probably this is just virtual time. And the idea of virtual space, because of what we were talking about, that flattened image of of how we are being you know, pushed into this situation. So we, we see that we can we are spending time and whatever we are doing with that time is being created and being replicated and being passed around. Because if you look again from the economic perspective, so I'm going back to that, where, where it is the time. I mean, labor happens in time. And that is why it becomes important. Yeah. So if there is no time, labor would make no sense. So here, if I can do the labor here, I'm doing the labor here, I'm talking here. This is the labor for the moment, for, for example, which is passed, getting passed on or my movements or whatever. But when it is passed on there, it is just simply labor and there is no space. It is the time which is going across and we are sharing that. So this is just a vague argument which is coming into my head. It doesn't mean that we need to derail the discussion, but this, this yeah, is but where I'm, I'm just trying, yeah. I'm trying to think along with what you say. So I'm thinking that if we consider labor in terms of time, it will just be a number. Whereas if we consider labor in terms of like work or activity, it will be a body. So I mean, it's a choice then. Uh, what well, would you ascribe to a number or a body? It's not my choice. In the in the economic <laughs> system and according to economics, it's a number, and that's how it is being calculated. Labor is calculated as a number in terms of time, in terms of whatever it produces. So they, the focus of economy, which is problematic, I don't agree with that. And what you're saying is what I agree with, but then it won't be economics. And I, am, I even feel that there is no need for economics also in the world. It's a different argument I can take you on to. But uh, the idea is that it is the number and this is what we are struggling with. This is what we are challenging and questioning. And therefore, I am also mm -hmm. thinking, is this really virtual space that we are doing or we are being pushed? Why, why did the world virtual space came about along with virtual time? And so, so I'm thinking in terms of the it's epistemology and how it fits into the system. Does it push us into somewhere where we don't think beyond that and we accept it as a virtual space? So yeah, I'm going with your argument. I'm following it. So mm -hmm. in that sense, it would mean that in the digital world or in the virtual space, the presence of a body is a number. Do I understand it correctly? Is that what you are trying to say? Like the analogy between the real life economics and the virtual life economics is that we are addressing here. Like what becomes of a body in a virtual space? Does it become a number purely? I am myself asking that. That is it. Why are we calling it a number, uh, a virtual space? That's what I'm asking. And what is it becoming? In actual economy, labor becomes a number and so are what? bodies. What so, what would be what would be a, uh, like a good in terms of terminology? What what would you like to you know? What would be an alternative to to the word space, like as a concept for the virtual world? Are you asking me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I'm I don't have an answer. Oh yeah, I, yeah. And I'm not even worried about the answer. So I'm just raising the question. Yeah, it will help yeah. me also think along. I really have no answer. And I'm still. That's what I'm saying. I'm trying to debate. Why are we calling it a virtual space? Is it? Is it for this word? Is it forcing us to accept something? To believe that this? For example, just as I'm talking, I'm getting this argument. Is this word virtual space supposed to mean that this is how we are going to work on the screens and we have already discussed before how it is affecting us 
and we will keep believing that oh we are in that space we are alive there or something and we will keep working is that why the virtual space for example this is one of my questions why this word virtual space virtual time i can still i am kind of virtual space i am not sure why exactly i have no not complete grasp but i am feeling that there is uh, something which is not making me comfortable with this concept of virtual space but yeah i think i think it's a really good point about um the just the translation that that, that there's potentially sort of a um a forcing to normalize something that that isn't well currently isn't there right now for example i think the idea of the public commons or the public space doesn't exist right now in the real world world and so we're being forced um as a almost sticking plaster to deal with or reconceptualize public public space within the virtual and that i i'm interested in what what that means like what what is what is the public or private space in the virtual world because those are really political questions and it is cognitive capitalism but like do the does the what how does the public commons uh, function in the virtual in a way that is yeah like uh, quite political compared to the to the to the real public space I think we are still at the beginning of it all. You know, if you think about the uh, so-called virtual space being um, an encased environment of information, of data products, then we have not, we have encountered that only on a very, um, superficial level yet i feel um but i wanted to say i'm so sorry but i have to go now <laughs> in a few minutes um and i think now we are picking up on these really uh important issues is there a way of um communicating this further in another conversation i mean yeah, are yes. you planning to to continue this I'm sorry. Uh, we we can continue this because uh, uh, in next session there is a uh, different speakers and different uh, uh, moderator. So they will might have a different question. But I think the the Guillaume uh, also raised these questions like what is the public space right now and how we look at the public space uh, in, 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 in given these circumstances. Um, also, how we look at this, what is the, you know, the um, alternative practice, what is, uh, how we, and how we call like, you know, the, what is non-alternative practice. So that is also a big, uh, like, you know, the query, uh, query and questions but it is more about uh, how we look at this uh, space as a public space and virtual space and how we deal with that because uh, if you agree or not we are uh, dealing like we are spending our time in this space and somehow it it connect us in a you know the even it is a virtual or imaginary or uh, whatever we call in a terms of understanding we 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 are somehow engaged mentally as as well as we if we give the time in a you know now we are giving time here so the physically also so it it capture our attention by mental or physical both so how we look at this you no know? and what is the norms is created how how we see those you know the point or norms in within this uh you know the circumstance i think so yeah, I, we mean, I mean I, if any, I, I felt, but i feel like if anybody had something burning they wanted to say about, about anything yeah. they should just say it now 
as well. Thoughts on the public space in the virtual world? Uh, I would say that is, I think it's something we haven't figured out yet. I mean, in the past, in the early days of the internet, I think it was a bit more of it, or a bit more, things had a bit more the appearance of public space potentially when things were less and were less uh, gathered around huge corporations like Facebook, for instance. Um, but I think it's, I think that's something, I think there's plenty of possibility and potentiality around public space, and there's lots, countless initiatives for generating it, but it lacks the large amounts of adoption from people. And that I think anything that resembled like a really powerful public force of public space online um, would have to be highly differentiated and heterogeneous. And, um, you know, you'd have to have a whole, it would be a very complex, I think, and articulated field of websites and services that you could use that, that you could adopt that were relevant to you and that a lot of them would be local as well, you know. But I don't think we've figured it out yet because people aren't as upset by privacy problems as they maybe should be. <laughs> Bye, Dagmar. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going. I see you again soon. See you soon, Dagmar. Thank you, Pleasure. thank you for your time. Yeah. yeah. Okay, just one little thought on the public private space because this is, um, I think for me, this is a very important point as a performance artist as well. And uh, for example, when it was the starkness of that started occurring to me when I moved to Switzerland five years ago. And um, the, the whole issue of what is a public space where, uh, pub, uh, sorry, I would put one more word into that to understand public space, private space and surveillance. Because surveillance is what changes the essence of a public space. So if there is surveillance in a public space, then what is it? And today in, in context of this uh, situation, I was just thinking of when I look at Dimple's uh, visual, for example, I see the depth of the house behind, you know, the door is open and all. Now, this is a private space, but at the moment, this is a public space because she's sitting here, we are watching it. And not only just us eight, I do not know what the agreement we have given to the go to meeting and what data they are going to collect from us and what they are going to keep from that or refer to or whatever. And this idea of surveillance, so this virtual space again connects with this idea of surveillance, which we are aware is being pushed anyway. Uh, and and uh, the whole idea of surveillance is, is connected very deeply to the idea of economic controls in the world at the moment. So the, it, that can't be separated. And in this virtual space situation, one has really no clue. Wow. Do we all create like a small room in our house, which will be the conference or the video call room, which will, will that be the new drawing room or something in every house that there is, oh, I'm going to my virtual call room or something uh, to avoid privacy. I mean, th that was the whole structure of the house, no? that there is a living room or the drawing room where people would come in and sit and you meet and they don't come inside. In India, this was followed and I think in most places that would be how it is and this is where my concern would be that that there will be no uh, public or so-called public space it will all be under surveillance if we are to live like this or this I mean, there will be no space in that sense sorry okay. Yeah, that relates to what Josh was saying about the corporations kind of dominating the current public space, which is surveillance and economics, absolutely. Um, so it's a pretty dystopian kind of um, world, um, but we've been living in it for a while now. <laughs> but there are alternatives and yeah, uh, it's good to be discussing what those 
could be as we are in our infancy technologies. Um, yeah, my gosh. Whew. Uh, we said we'd do an hour and 40 minutes, eh? Yeah. And hour and 45. On that note, I think I will also need to leave and thank you. Really, this has been a very interesting discussion. So I thank everybody for sharing some very interesting points. Thank you. Thank you. And ciao, 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 ciao everyone. Bye. Ciao. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye and thanks a lot. <laughs>